Hey everyone, welcome to Iron Source's first webinar of 2019. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jasmine from Iron Source's marketing team. Before we get started, I just wanted to tell you a bit more about what we do here at Iron Source. So, Iron Source builds marketing and monetization solutions for app developers. Our mediation platform is currently number one in the market for game developers, and our UA platform is used by UA managers around the world. If you want to learn more about us, head to www.ironsrc.com. Today, Evgeny Perez, our VP Growth, and Dan Greenberg, our Chief Design Officer, are going to discuss best UA practices. Dan and Evgeny both had the most popular sessions at our Game Fest event back in November, so we thought we'd bring their presentations to you. Uh, feel free to ask any questions in the chat while they're speaking. Dan and Evgeny will do their best to answer them during the webinar, and we'll also have time at the end for answering questions. Okay, let's start. Take it away. Thanks, Jasmine. Hi, guys. Um, Happy to be here uh, to discuss uh, this important topic. Uh, as Jasmine uh, mentioned earlier, uh, this is who we are. That's uh, what we focus on um, in terms of uh, our strategy and, and the product that we deliver to the markets. Um, um, these are some of the top uh, partners that we work with. Basically, uh, if you take a look at the top uh, games, you'll see our technology implemented. Um, for monetization and for uh, user acquisition purposes. Um, so we'll try to bring some best practices from what you've been seeing uh, across the market and how this can uh, impact uh, your uh, strategy. Uh, a bit about the company, um, how it's spread globally. Um, as you can see at uh, the bottom, uh, in terms of uh, our local offices across the globe. Welcome to and um, I'll jump right in. Cool. Um, so in this session, uh, so we only have one hour. Um, basically, we'll try to focus on uh, the journey of taking a, a game that you've built and launching it uh, into a profitable business. Uh, we'll try to focus on the main items um, that we think uh, can slow you down, and we'll, we'll uh, provide some best practices on what you can and uh, probably should you do about this. And uh, we'll, we'll leave, leave time to answer your uh, questions. Uh, one of the most uh, important topics when, when uh, developing and, and releasing a game into the market is uh, trying to understand uh, and answer the question uh, of uh, how to uh, market a game and how to optimize its marketability. And uh, how do we take a, a good game and turn it into a good, good business or is uh, your game uh, being good? Is that enough for it to be, uh, become a good business? Um, in, in this example, basically, um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's a comparison between two games um, in terms of how uh, they retain users on the left from uh, day zero to day 30. You can see how much better game A is in this case. Um, and on the right side, you can see how those two games monetize in, the, in their first 30 days. And you can see how uh, revenue accumulates and the difference between those two games were uh, game A uh, monetizes much, much better uh, than B. Um, sorry, one sec. Um, and this is kind of uh, looking at the, the market in the last couple of years. This is where uh, we've seen most games uh, like game B uh, being left out uh, of the business plans and where most studios and, and publishers were fo focusing on uh, optimizing and releasing game A. Uh, but that's not necessarily um, what we uh, believe uh, is the best practice necessarily. Uh, because one of the uh, main reasons, um, one of the big questions to answer would be how uh, those uh, games actually fit the market and how can they, uh, if at all, become uh, good businesses at scale in terms of profitability. And these two examples, um, basically, um, assuming that uh, you cannot bid more than you make, and this to simplify these numbers, uh, if you want to be profitable by day 30, um, in these two examples of these uh, two games, A and B, uh, what should be your uh, CPI to start with? Um, for the sake of the example, to simplify this, if you want to become profitable by day 30, you should bid around a dollar for game A uh, on average, and uh, for game B, this, this would be 20 cents. Um, and this is all uh, under the assumption that um, um, these are uh, 
the metrics and that, that, those will be your average bids uh, and that's how you account, accumulate revenue in order to be uh, a bit profitable around day 30 just to simplify things um, and now to answer the question uh, of whether or not you'll be able to grow your game uh, profitably at scale um, one of the most imp important things uh, to understand uh, in depth is how uh, the market uh, is addressable to uh, game developers in terms of uh, how many users can you reach, how many people uh, will see your marketing efforts in front of their eyes, um, and um, basically out of all those potential addressable users, uh, only a few of them will see uh, impressions, only a few of them will uh, uh, click. Uh, that will be uh, what is called a click through rate. Um, out of those that click through, uh, only some will install, and that would be the conversion rate from click to install. Um, and um, I'd like to introduce a very important metric that we use a lot internally uh, with our partners as well, uh, and, in, and within our platform, and that would be the ITM, uh, which is the installs per thousand impressions. Uh, in order to gauge uh, that uh, 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 part of the funnel, where basically we're trying to answer out of all those users that watched the ad, how many did really go and uh, play the game at least once. Um, this is uh, how it's uh, calculated, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's uh, installs per thousand impressions. Um, and it is an important metric that has to be uh, looked at in order to understand how the market reacts to the game that you've built. And it is the biggest unknown factor uh, as you develop the game. Uh, and uh, this is, um, something that uh, when you look across the board in terms of benchmarks uh, it is there's a very big difference between different types of games in terms of how they react uh, and how, how the market reacts to those games uh, on average and this is just a few examples of uh, different categories and how uh, those uh, IPM vary <laughs> and you can see um, exactly where you fit and you should know that this is the benchmark you should be aiming for uh, prior to your release uh, in order to understand uh, where you need to be aiming. And we'll dive deeper into what IPM exactly is, how, how you can impact this, and how you can push it upwards. Um, usually, uh, this together with, I, with ECPM are uh, metrics that usually are overlooked by marketing teams. And uh, in the last couple of years, it's clear that uh, uh, overlooking those metrics uh, harms your ability to grow successfully. So one of the most important things would be to um, uh, learn more about those metrics, implement processes in measuring them from the uh, advertising uh, from the advertising perspective. ECPM is a metric of how much, uh, uh, on average, how much revenue are you spending on uh, a thousand impressions uh, from the user acquisition perspective. Uh, although this metric is used uh, uh, usually from the ad monetization perspective to gauge the effectiveness of the ads that you show in your game, uh, but it is a very important metric to actually, uh, even as important uh, to, uh, to measure from the marketing perspective. Um, and it really helps you to measure effectiveness uh, and potential of what you are trying to achieve with your uh, uh, strategy. And I'll show a few examples in a bit. Um, as we've achieved the, the, these CPIs for games A and B, as you remember, a uh, dollar per game A and uh, 20 cents for game B, um, the combination of that CPI bid, the cost per install, with the IPM, which we still don't know, will uh, dictate the eCPM of our campaign. And since IPM is the biggest unknown factor, um, we need to be able to uh, understand it and, and optimize it in order to increase our eCPM in order to drive scale. Now I'll explain uh, what exactly, how exactly that impacts your ability to uh, market a game. Uh, this graph is uh, um, uh, showing uh, averages uh, of performance uh, in terms of your share of voice, that is the, X, uh, the, the Y axis uh, versus the eCPM uh, of, uh, of a campaign. And the idea here is that if you have uh, um, these uh, you're running campaigns on these uh, two platforms of uh, Android and, and iOS, and if you're running across uh, in this example uh, rewarded videos and interstitials, this is how you are able to achieve a certain uh, share of voice of impressions uh, 
on a specific channel um, if you reach that ECPM. Uh, for the for example, if you're running an Android and interstitial campaign, you have ten dollars ECPM, you will reach sixty percent of your potential uh, within that channel. Um, if you have an ECPM of uh, twenty dollars on uh, rewarded video uh, Android, you will reach 85% of uh, potential on that specific channel. And uh, it's very important to understand uh, what that exactly means in terms of your business. So if you land in this zone where uh, your ECPMs are sub $5, you're dealing barely with a few impressions for that, from that channel, no matter which channel it is. Um, and uh, obviously these metrics behave differently per channel, but that means that there's some work to do in terms of optimization. Currently, the current setup is not marketable. So you cannot really scale things up. Um, most of the successful advertisers live in this zone where uh, their apps are marketable. Uh, they live in these zones in terms of their ECPMs. Um, and um, this part, which we call the fun zone, is where advertisers actually achieve very high CPMs, which means that as ad servers uh, prioritize which ads to show based on the CPM they generate, this means that in most cases your ad will be shown. Uh, in this example, if your eCPM is $70, um, you don't have to bid as much. Uh, you can actually drop your bid by uh, 30, 40 percent and still drive the same volume, which will result in higher profits. Uh, the two apps that I gave the example for earlier, um, this is real data, uh, those, this is where they landed actually uh, on this marketability graph. So app A, even though it showed higher retention rates, higher ARPA rates, uh, five times better than uh, game B, actually the market reacted with an IPM of five. And they land in this zone, this means their ability to drive incremental users to their game is extremely limited uh, compared to game B that even though it monetizes uh, uh, five times weaker than game A, it's actually getting uh, uh, achieving a much bigger impact as the IPM is 50. This means that the market likes game B 10 times more than it likes game A in terms of the decision process of which game am I uh, going to be downloading. So if we, we have a room of a thousand people, we show uh, ads for game A and B, only five will download A and 50 will download B. Uh, and that will result in a much, much higher. Um, as now you can understand better the, the impact of uh, the combination of the bid, your ability to bid and your ability to uh, reach to the market and, and engage them into your app and, and the EC game drives. One of the most uh, important things in order to uh, optimize and push your IPM upwards would be created. As CPI is something that is much, much harder to optimize in terms of your ability to monetize. There's much more freedom on the IPM uh, um, level to optimize and push things forward. And this is one of where I want to have Dan, uh, uh, which is our uh, probably the best uh, person I know to talk to creatives. Uh, so we had a really nice setup in the beginning of the broadcast. <clears throat> Of being together, but now it's going to be one in frame. So, <clears throat> okay. So, we want to talk a bit about uh, about creative and the impact that it has on campaigns today. So, first of all, um, I'm going to refer to what Evgeny uh, said before. Um, we know that for every game, we have our our bid, our CPI that we can pay in order to generate an install, which is that has to be lower than the LTV that we generate. Like uh, this is like the basic rule. Uh, it's a very well-known formula, uh, nothing new. But in order to, to increase that bid, <clears throat> it means that we have to increase the LTV of the game itself, meaning we need to develop and release new versions. We have to improve the monetization. Uh, we even sometimes need to rebalance the economy of the game itself, which is something that you can't really do once the game is out there uh, at large scale. And of course, the hardest thing to increase retention. And, and all of us know that it's a slow and very hard process to actually achieve. Uh, on the other hand, there's the IPM range, right? So on IPM, we have uh, currently, uh, the network average is 9.4, okay? Um, so meaning that out of 1,000 impressions, nine people on average will install a game. This is today. By the way, two years ago, 
uh, it was around two. Uh, so also kind of as more uh, people are getting familiar with mobile gaming, uh, we see IPMs increase. Um, so currently the network average is nine. Uh, what we've seen in the past, let's say three months, uh, an all time record was around 86. Uh, when we look on the average of the total network, so meaning from 9 to 86, there's already a huge range um, that we can improve on the IPM itself. Uh, 100 IPM is what we call Optimus Primes. So once we achieve that, it's very like goal that we have in the team. Uh, and of course, there is a theoretical limit of 1,000. So let's say in a world where we have 1,000 impressions and all of the 1,000 impressions generate an install, this is like the God mode. So what we want to emphasize here is to show how much range do we have on the IPM and how much there's like leeway uh, to test and change stuff. And in that context, um, I want to make a big statement, which is creative can make or break your game business. So if you today are building um, a serious and big uh, game business, uh, creative is a huge part of it because of the way it can help you actually scale and do better anyway. Um, so I want to talk about something really big that happened in the past two years. So up until like, let's say two years ago, this was the regular UA funnel. We had the impression, then we had a click, install, and then we could measure the user engagement of the users that were brought in. But kind of two years ago, um, it was the it, it was like the rebirth of the playable ads, the interactive formats that were, were actually known in the web uh, for a long time um, came back to mobile games, and it really changed the whole industry uh, in terms of how UA looks uh, looks like today. And what actually happened is that the user engagement got pushed up the funnel. Okay, so uh, within the ad itself, when we're talking about playable ads. Um, you would see the user engagement and the experience of the game itself happens within the ad. And it really changed the whole matrix down the funnel of the amounts of clicks, the installs, and mainly the LTV of the users that we're bringing in because they already got a taste of the game, they understand what they're downloading, and it's a really huge difference uh, to what we've seen in like the traditional uh, user acquisition. Another thing that happened is that between the impression and the click or the impression and the tap, there is like a, a huge universe of experiences that you can build. It's not a one-off uh, video that has a static a beginning and end. Uh, it's, a dynamic, it's a dynamic experience that can really uh, change and, uh, and vary. And in order for us, and kind of this is how we did this internally in Iron Source, uh, we developed a whole set of new matrix, uh, what we call ined data. Okay, so this is like the ined matrix that we are that we are collecting, and it helps us really understand what's going on within the ad itself. Uh, once it's an interactive format, a playable ad. So things like engagement rates, okay, so the percentage of users that engage with the ad itself, are are really important. And, and, and also, for example, click-through rates. So CTR got split to different funnels. So if it's a winning game CTR or losing game CTR. So this is just a quick sample of a few metrics that we're collecting. And all of these are also are multiplied by the number of variants that we are having, uh, that we are uh, pushing live with each playable that we're building. So uh, again, playable is dynamic uh, creative. Uh, we always go up with at least five different variations of difficulty, speed, number of lives that you have in the playable itself. And all of this combination together uh, uh, becomes over 8 billion in-ad events that we are collecting every month from the ads that we're serving. So it's a huge amount of data, and we are leveraging um, the fact that we are a very uh, big mediation platform and network and taking that technological infrastructure, which is a huge challenge to build, in order to measure those uh, funnels that happen within the ad itself, okay? So the thing that I want to emphasize from that is that we need to understand that today, uh, the creative or the ad itself is part of your onboarding funnel. So let's say two, three years ago, uh, you would get the user to the game itself, and then you would worry about the tutorial and like the first three levels, and it is, it's still the case today, but it actually kind of stretches out to the ad experience itself. 
and we need to take it into consideration when we plan our user acquisition, okay? So Evgeny kind of touched about uh, marketability, which is a huge part of how we achieve uh, uh, a successful, how do we build a successful game business uh, today. And one of the major parts uh, of where we're investing today in that is what we call Creative Soft Launch, uh, which is a program that we started, I think about also a year and a half ago uh, with a few major titles. And I kind of wanted to show you how it looks like. So we know that during, during uh, uh, building a game, there is the game design and, and the game design uh, part where uh, the, the studio is working really hard to uh, build all the levels and balance the economy and kind of create those uh, tests. And usually you would probably buy at small scale a few, a few users just for uh, the sake of, of uh, uh, tweaking your game itself. And we actually, uh, in this part of the, of the life cycle, um, uh, started working on doing a creative soft launch in parallel, meaning that we are building uh, a few different playables and through different creatives and, and trying and starting to uh, cycle them through to find the best top performing creatives. And this, when it's done right, has, uh, has a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, major benefits for before you're going uh, live on global launch. But one of them is the fact that you can start generating high ECPM uh, and creatives that allow you to see the whole market. Okay, so maybe within that uh, app, which is a uh, game, which is a direct competitor of yours, there is that audience that is 100% relevant for you. But in order to be shown on this, on this specific publisher, you need to generate very high CPMs. And with uh, uh, retesting and doing all the stuff on the, on the soft launch uh, period, you can actually find those publishers and find those places that, that hold that type of audience. And the idea is also, uh, and this kind of looks like if you show a real graph, so this is the pre-soft launch uh, with the small scale uh, acquisition mainly for, uh, for game design. This is the soft launch period, and this is the global launch. And what you want to do, you want to learn here, and you don't want to learn when you're already in, when you're already in, uh, in full uh, global launch mode, because then it's very hard to iterate. You're probably managing a few different channels at the same time. And, and, and you probably won't be focused as you are when you're focusing uh, on the creative soft launch uh, period. A quick case study uh, from uh, uh, working with uh, uh, a company, uh, that, uh, partner, Game Insight, uh, on the launch of Trade Island, which was a very big launch for them uh, a few months ago, we did the same process. So we created a few different creatives, and we started testing them. And one of the playables had uh, almost 3.5x uh, improvement in IPM, okay, uh, versus the best top performing uh, in-house creative that, that we had. And this actually allowed us uh, to go to global launch. So you see here how it looks like again with the graphs. So this is the soft launch er uh, period and the global launch to a really massive scale without any uh, massive learning costs. And again, very targeted in the right places, okay? and. The main, the main insight and the main takeaway from this is that doing all of the, all of the uh, creative tests and launching when you're really ready uh, is a big part of um, any success in game business today, okay? So again, up until now, you maybe were really focused on the game matrix, on, 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 uh, on the monetization, and starting to do user acquisition after it launched, uh, and Maybe in, in, within the creative soft launch itself, you'll find out there's a different character that works well and that improves your marketability, right? And, and then only when you have your user acquisition ready, you need to launch today because the market is very different and it's, not, uh, it's a really part of the success. So just to, to do a quick recap on the creative part, um, creative is much quicker and easier to, to improve versus tweaking the actual game. Uh, creative Day is part of the onboarding funnel. You have to know your category benchmark, so again, it touched on that in terms of understanding what are the IPMs within the category, and during soft launch, 
understanding are you close to the to the category benchmarks in user acquisition okay and again focus to launch when you really crack your creative performance and I want to kind of to finish about uh, thinking what can you actually do about it so we talked about interactive formats labels maybe some of the things uh, you're not sure how to approach it so first of all uh, I'm, I want to emphasize that you need to invest in turning creative optimization into part of your co core capabilities today. Any big uh, successful game business today has this as part of kind of the core capability and either is developing it uh, internally. Um, the question, second question, who can build the creative? So if you have a great in-house team, amazing, probably you're focused on the game itself and it's hard to get those resources. So, uh, so networks like us can help, uh, but also there's a lot of great uh, vendors out there that can help you uh, build uh, playables or creatives. Use them, uh, get it as part of your uh, part of your process. And monitoring and optimizing uh, frequently is also a very important thing. Um, again, creative because it has such a huge impact and potentially can, like you saw, uh, triple the performance of, of any campaign. You have to keep it close, and you have to make sure that you're always uh, um, monitoring and optimizing it uh, as much as possible. Okay, and uh, I take it to back to Evgeny to talk about how do we combine that within like the bigger picture of the growth. Hey, Jan. Hi, guys. I'm back. Uh, feel free to ask any questions in the uh, chat box uh, so we can uh, address them later um, before we end. Um, Cool. So I want, I want to introduce uh, a framework that uh, should help, uh, I believe, should help you try to understand how to pinpoint the gaps that you have and, and where to focus your efforts in terms of uh, optimizing your growth. And uh, we call this the, the growth loop. Basically, um, um, what you're going to see is kind of divided between the game that you build, assuming that you've built it and it's ready uh, to start uh, to be shipped. Um, any, anything above the line would be uh, all those users out there that you're trying to bring into your game. And uh, one of the first steps, obviously, is to bring users into your uh, game. Uh, those are e either acquired or uh, organic users that uh, decided to come and, and, and check, check out your new game. Um, this is also true for any game that is already live, uh, if, in case you hit the ground running, uh, trying to optimize uh, this. Uh, the second step after you get uh, the second step after you get those users into the game is basically how the product uh, is able to uh, monetize those users in terms of revenue. Uh, obviously, the uh, biggest tools uh, to monetize them would be ads and in-app purchases. Um, and this is kind of where um, um, usually uh, things become more complex. Uh, the, the way your product uh, works is as is. And uh, part of uh, part of your job is to be able to, uh, to be able to maximize the revenue generated from those users. So in order to really uh, optimize monetization, you need to measure things and an analyze them. I'll, I'll go deeper into each step in a bit. And basically, every time users come in, uh, our, our job is to, to try and, 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 uh, and make things uh, worthwhile in terms of our revenues if you want to make it a business. Uh, and then after those users leave, we're left with uh, their behavior, their metrics, uh, and we also uh, are now trying to basically close that loop, accelerate it, um, and uh, make the right marketing decisions in terms of uh, uh, Accelerating that uh, loop. So, if we started with a thousand users that arrived for the first time, how do we uh, generate the the right uh, insights and actions to have ten thousand users back into the game tomorrow profitably, and a million users uh, in two months um, uh, that will uh, keep coming back uh, and uh, accelerating that uh, loop and uh, effectively turning this into a business. I want to start with actually, uh, sorry, before I uh, move on, uh, to simplify things. I didn't mention this earlier. Um, anything that is happening with the game, with the game, the goal, um, in most cases, whether it's a game or not, um, is to maximize the average revenue per user. That's kind of um, 
the result of how you optimize retention, how do you optimize the content, how you uh, stabilize the product and keep uh, optimizing that where the end goal is that uh, those users uh, uh, um, should be translated into maximized ARPU. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna share uh, how uh, to reach that optimal point. Anything uh, in terms of the engagement with the market itself or the users out there that are not playing their game or left their game is how to get them back, most of them back, uh, and get as, as many users back uh, as profitably as possible. So the goal would be to maximize profit. Uh, so those are kind of the two big problems uh, that needs to be addressed, uh, maximizing profit and maximizing output. I want to start with actually what is happening within the game. We don't have much time, so I won't go in, in, in depth to uh, uh, some things, but uh, obviously this is where a lot of the product work is done. Uh, a lot of the analytics and, and measurement parts are done. I'm going to uh, mention some things and go deeper into what we think uh, we have enough time and, and there's enough value to uh, focus on. Um, obviously, one of the most important things uh, is measurement across all this loop. Uh, if things are not measured, they cannot be analyzed, they cannot be uh, optimized, and there's no real insights that you will be uh, deriving from this process. Uh, so you're kind of lost uh, and blind without measurement. Um, Product-wise, obviously, game onboarding, the first-time user experience is critical, how content is being generated and the value of that content um, uh, in terms of uh, how is the funnel behaving uh, for those users that are trying to play the game and uh, advance, uh, how are you calling those users back in in terms of the daily rewards and best practices around that. There's a lot to read uh, online. Uh, uh, within our blog uh, or other blogs as well uh, on that front. Um, obviously, technical uh, stability around crashes, uh, that needs to be measured with the right tools. Uh, if if 20% of your users are, uh, are having issues, that's a big uh, problem to solve. Obviously, it will impact your ARPU uh, and might devastate it. Um, the game economy design and optimization is a huge topic to discuss, which we want to go uh, deeper this time. Uh, as well as things around in-app purchases. Uh, how do you price things uh, combined with your game economy design, your live ops efforts, uh, how do you place those uh, engagement points, and how do you segment users to kind of maximize ARPU? Uh, we'll try to address those things in the, uh, in the future in uh, maybe one of our next webinars. But for now, uh, these are uh, high-level topics that should be addressed. Um, there's a, not a lot of knowledge to be gathered. If you feel there's a gap, feel free to reach out. Uh, we'll share whatever we have uh, on that. Um, in terms of ad products, uh, one of the most interesting things is around uh, the type of ad products. We divided it kind of two different uh, uh, types of ad products, uh, those that are system initiated, where you as the developer decides where exactly you place them, those with the banners, the interstitials, where the users are um, engaging with seeing those ads when, when, whenever you decide to show them the ad. And the second group is uh, the user initiated, what we call, those would be usually the rewarded uh, products, uh, rewarded videos, off walls, where the user decides to engage with an ad in order to gain uh, either a reward, revive, a boost. So many uh, different things that uh, you can do to optimize and implement best practices. Uh, the biggest difference between this group and, and the system initiated is that Every one of those placements is effectively a feature within within the game, uh, within the loop of the game, and that can uh, expedite uh, retention and have a, a very positive impact on how users engage with the economy itself. Uh, so basically, those are two groups. Uh, obviously, the user-initiated ads uh, are a very big part of uh, ad monetization today. Um, um, how they increase retention, how they uh, engage users, those are usually uh, the, the tools that users uh, treat them as an alternative payment method, where system initiated is, is a more complex uh, the challenge of how exactly are you optimizing those placements, whether or not uh, it's right to show a certain ad at a certain frequency, and we'll be able to uh, share uh, more insights in the, in the future. Uh, there's a lot of best practices you can read uh, uh, on our website. Uh, take a look. Uh, if you feel there's a gap there, um, just to show some some uh, to you some uh, points around uh, um, how those uh, behave. When you think about our DAO, which is the average revenue for daily active user, um, the more ads you show, the higher your 
average revenue for daily active user. That's kind of a, a given. Um, but uh, the impact uh, of ads on your game is very different between, between those two products. Uh, as if users are surprised to see ads and they have not opted in, uh, over time you will see a decay in your uh, retention metrics. And this is where things uh, become more interesting. If you, you're monetizing users using system-initiated ads, banners, and distitials, the more ads you show, the more aggressive you are, uh, your retention is going to go down. So even though you generated a higher ARB DAO, um, you have more users leaving. So the DAO will be lower for that cohort. On the user-initiated fraud, there's a lot of uh, ways to utilize it uh, uh, within your economy, and that actually increases your uh, uh, retention. Um, to kind of translate uh, the impact of, of this uh, challenge from optimizing ARP DAO uh, and retention together, uh, the more ads you show, the lower your retention is for system-initiated ads. But your ARP DAO is going up. So where exactly that uh, is that sweet spot where uh, you're exactly at the right uh, uh, spot to be able to maximize ARP is something that requires testing and is supported by a platform um, to help you optimize that. But that's a very important question to uh, to answer for you, for yourself, uh, in terms of maximizing things within the game. Um, how those uh, ads are placed, uh, there's a lot of best practices for uh, user-initiated, as you've probably seen them across many games, uh, the try again, a placements, the revive, boosts, hints, lives, doubling the reward that you're getting. Um, there's a many, many best practices that you can uh, uh, read, and basically, if you follow the the most popular games, you will see most of them. Uh, a lot of it will be uh, having a very positive impact on your game, uh, as I showed earlier. For the system initiated, uh, the best practice around the main screen and the stitchels, um, the where exactly those are placed and what is the frequency, something that is required up and requires optimization. Uh, segmentation is a very important tool uh, to utilize. Uh, assuming you have the capability uh, of uh, having insights into those segments. If you want to target specific users uh, with specific uh, ad placements, that's something that uh, requires uh, data measurement and uh, the right to set up uh, within the game itself. Uh, one of the most important things around ad-based ad, uh, ad uh, monetization is how exactly do you measure uh, things on the user level? How do you, how do you know how much revenue each user generated, so you can be able, be able to segment those users in the, in the future. If you have ad wheels, how do you address those in the future? Where did those users come from, and, and what are your next steps? And, and this is a key thing to your success, especially if you're uh, monetizing with ads, uh, no matter um, uh, how, how much that is. Uh, that's why we released uh, a couple of months ago, um, almost six months ago, uh, the capability of uh, Ad revenue measurement on the user level, where basically we assign a dollar number for each device ID. We make it accessible uh, to you guys. Um, where basically the idea here is that uh, measurement is done not, not only for in-app purchases, uh, but also for ad revenue. In this case, the game Run Rabbit in this demo uh, slide is acquiring users from Hit the Clown, Talking Cat, and all these other guys. These, this is the revenue that those users generated uh, for RunRabbit uh, from in-app purchases, and this would be the revenue generated from uh, ads. And now that you know the combination of both, uh, you can make the right decisions. So not measuring that uh, can really impact uh, how efficient you are with your user acquisition that I'm going to discuss in a bit. Um, that's a key point for making decisions uh, in the game. One of the most interesting things is how uh, uh, ad revenue and in-app purchase revenue generated by users accumulates over time. There's a big difference in how those users behave. Uh, so it's very important to measure and decide uh, uh, how you want to uh, tackle that in terms of your uh, LTV prediction, how do you define uh, return on ad spend goals, and how do you translate that into actions uh, in your user acquisition uh, perspective which is basically the next step uh, within, the, uh, within the process, is how you take everything uh, from what you've measured within the game and how to use that in order to accelerate this loop. Uh, so a few pointers of things that uh, 
will help you accelerate the, uh, the loop uh, outside of, uh, of your game and how, in terms of how you engage with users, how do you target users. Obviously, Dan touched the biggest thing, which is creatives, but I want to address other uh, forces that are pushing your IPM up and down. Um, when you think about the IPM again, this is uh, if, if, there, if, you, if there's a thousand users that are seeing your ad and X uh, download the game, how do you take that number and push it upwards? Uh, or if there's anything that you're doing wrong and it's actually pushing it downwards. Um, creatives, Dan discussed this uh, briefly. There's a lot more obviously to that, uh, but it is one of the biggest factors uh, that can really impact your IPM. And uh, in many cases, people are uh, uh, not aware of the potential here. Things like App Store optimization in the game itself, uh, in terms of the, uh, the content uh, rating, uh, the app size itself, the permissions you guys require, all of those uh, things um, are, uh, they need to be addressed because uh, that's part of the decision process uh, before the users uh, decide to open the game, uh, even download it. So that's something that needs to be addressed. So if you do feel like you need help with App Store optimization, try to, try to optimize that. That can have a very big impact on your IPM. And obviously, uh, the game itself, you know, the best example would be having a one gigabyte game versus a 30 megabyte game. That can really uh, have a big impact on your IPM as, as a one gigabyte game is very hard to download. Um, other things that are critical in this part of the loop as well as measurements uh, as well, as I mentioned earlier, um, measuring uh, all your impressions, your views, your clicks, across all of your channels, no matter who they are, uh, is very important for you to be able to obviously measure IPM. If you don't have views, you cannot measure IPM. You're blind to that metric. Uh, but other than that, leveling the playing field in terms of measurement, where all the channels that you work with report a view when there's a view, and they report a click only if a user clicked on the ad. That's very important um, uh, to a level that you need to police it. Uh, measuring your in-app purchases using uh, your uh, analytics platforms and attribution platforms and using ad revenue on the user level to be able to make the right decisions. Uh, measuring cost for each user so you're able to know where exactly are you uh, profitable or not. Um, in terms of the attribution windows, now that you have measurement around views and clicks, you also need to level the playing field across all the platforms um, with, the, with the same windows. Um, so you can start where, where, uh, uh, where you compare apples to apples, and then you can make decisions in terms of how you want to optimize those windows based on the different types of ads. Uh, the bigger the impact, the bigger the, the stronger the intent uh, of a certain ad placement you want to give more credit to. And the weaker it is, you want to uh, give it less uh, credit based on that intent. Seamless uh, attribution flow is very important. If a user clicks on an ad, it's very important to make sure that those users are being directed uh, 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 to your app, to the store. Uh, one of the most important things is uh, impression waste. Uh, if you have a game that has 50 million downloads, um, it's very important to implement uh, suppression, uh, uh, and historical suppression, which basically means it's an exclusion list of all the historical users that already had your app. Because if uh, you're not implementing that across all your channels, a lot of users that already have your app installed will see your uh, an ad for your app uh, again but those will not be converted based on the attribution metrics, which will drive your IPM down. Um, fraud, which I'm going to address next, is uh, the biggest uh, IPM killer, uh, which is uh, uh, usually uh, not perceived uh, as uh, such because um, one of the biggest, uh, I'd say, uh, unknowns is the impact of fraud uh, coming from a fraudulent channel on other channels. Um, and um, in terms of how it looks like, uh, when you start uh, running user acquisition, basically the idea here is that every channel that you turn on for marketing needs to be uh, in incremental. Um, I'm not going to go deeper into incrementality and how to measure incrementality, but you need to be able to answer the question, is that channel incremental at all? Uh, so in this example, obviously, if you start working with uh, the orange uh, group of channels, uh, those will be incremental. If you add another channel, you would expect it to be incremental as well. And when you're dealing with fraud, uh, the biggest impact is actually that uh, channel is not incremental, whether it's those users are fake or those users are 
uh, organic, like in this case. Uh, basically, today, most of uh, uh, the biggest part of fraud is how uh, attribution is being manipulated, which means that uh, there are a lot of installs that are attributed to the gray channel associated to your blue organics, but not only that, they're actually attributed to uh, your incremental channel. So that, what that means is that if you have an IPM of 10 on a certain channel and you turn another channel that is driving uh, fraud or manipulating attribution, your IPM is going to drop on the channel that you had uh, IPM of 10 earlier because installs that that channel is driving are actually being misattributed to another channel that is driving uh, attribution manipulation. And that will actually take your numbers down, uh, your profit down, your overall installs will go down, even though uh, the installs that are attributed to those fraudulent channels look good, because they are good. Uh, some of them are organic, some of them are paid from other sources, but overall your business is taking a big hit, not only in terms of the money you're wasting on those channels, but actually the loss, uh, the, the opportunity cost of the users that you're no longer acquiring since your ECPM just dropped. Uh, so it's very important to uh, be able to identify the differences between those channels, decide which one is incremental or not, and to uh, skip to uh, an incremental uh, growth phase. Um, more things uh, before we finish to kind of uh, think about and address um, uh, around the um, um, growth and uh, accelerating the loop would be uh, how exactly do you uh, make optimization decisions, how do you bid uh, in the right place to uh, take advantage of opportunities uh, based on the performance of those users, how do they monetize from in-app purchases and ad revenue so you'll be able to bid the right price based on, on the behavior of those users. This also means that in some cases you need to drop your bids to increase your profits without losing uh, uh, volume. Some cases you want to increase your bids to drive more, val more value, more profit from those channels that drive uh, uh, higher uh, ARPU users. Obviously, opening to new markets is something that uh, usually uh, people are slower with. Uh, if you have, uh, fig if you figured out this loop for a single market, try uh, to expedite the process of opening other markets because you ha already have enough data. You can implement the same methodology. Uh, usually, opening markets is uh, a uh, pretty simple process, but this can really expedite the growth. Uh, so if you only have users in a few countries, it doesn't mean that uh, approaching other countries, uh, assuming your app is live in those markets, uh, will slow you down. It will actually expedite your growth, assuming those markets are big, obviously, in terms of prioritization. Uh, the, uh, challenging things with new ad products, new touch points uh, uh, with those uh, users to try, try to, to reach more users and drive the cost down effectively. Uh, with time, as you have acquired many users, you want to start retargeting those users that have been valuable and have left your app um, using building audiences and applying uh, a very similar approach to this. And uh, as this loop uh, uh, is, uh, uh, needs to be accelerating, you need to constantly optimize ARPU and profit uh, and try to pinpoint uh, where exactly are exactly your gaps and what needs to be uh, uh, done in order to uh, reach that optimal optimal point for ARPU and profit. Um, the key takeaways to kind of summarize uh, everything here would be measurement around everything as Dan, Dan mentioned, uh, even within how uh, users engage in, uh, inside the ads uh, that are running the, the, the interactive ads down to how uh, views are uh, served, clicks, uh, installs, and everything within the game, in-app purchases, uh, using attribution, and um, user-level ad revenue. Um, building a good game does not necessarily mean it's gonna be a good business, um, as well as the, the opposite uh, here, and it all depends on how the market will react and how will these multipliers or your ability to bid with how the market reacts uh, uh, will behave. and. Uh, Focus on breaking that ECPM glass ceiling to reach that point where you can really maximize uh, volume uh, and actually maximize profit uh, to have the right bids and the right plates, the places. Um, um, the product market fit of the game you build, even though it's not amazing, combined with the right monetization, to break that glass ceiling is a win, basically, and that should be your compass. Uh, 
optimizing continuously uh, uh, these three zones of IPM, how the market uh, reacts uh, to my game. ARPU is how do I monetize my users and profit basically is how good am I at acquiring more and more users. Um, op optimizing those three layers will promise that you, you reach close to that optimal point. Um, Higher ad ARP DAO isn't necessarily higher ARPU. That's something that is very important. The more ads you uh, add, does not necessarily mean you're going to have a higher revenue. So it needs to be optimized within the system initiated uh, ads accordingly. Uh, you need to start somewhere, and then you need to start optimizing. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, keep in mind that fraud is the number one IPM killer. Uh, try to address this problem from the incrementality uh, perspective where uh, you need to understand is that channel incremental or not based on your overall installs within the attribution platforms, within the, uh, the, the platforms, iTunes Connect, uh, the Google Developers Console to be able to understand is marketing working for me from this channel or not, and then make your decision uh, based on that. That is it.